Hello, my name is Christy Hodson, and I'm pastor at the Stoneham Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church, located at 29 Maple Street. For over 100 years, our church has been serving the communities in and around Stoneham, Massachusetts. We currently have a clothing distribution and food bank for Stoneham residents that's located at 9 Gary Street. We also operate Greater Boston Academy, an elementary and preschool located at 108 Pond Street. We thank you for joining us here today at our weekly church service. In his book, Joy in the Journey Through the Year, Michael Card talks about communion. And he speaks of communion as uh, when he discovered for the first time in his life that communion became holy communion. That it meant life and peace and joy. He realized that when he discovered that Paul's call to examine ourselves before we take communion was not there to give a full accounting of our sins and thereby be worthy to come to the table. The call to examine ourselves helps us to realize that we have no right to be there at all. You and I, we are the prostitutes and the tax collectors that Jesus welcomed to fellowship with him. He felt that joy that comes only from seeing that we have no right to come to the table at all, but that Jesus welcomes us as his special guests to be astounded at his generosity. We're going to sing some songs this morning about coming closer to Jesus. We're going to start with hymn number 313, Just As I Am. But this tune is probably different than the one you normally sing and know. I'm going to ask Dr. Crandall to play it through once so you can hear it, and we'll sing the first and second verses. Hymn number 313, Just As I Am, hymn uh, verses 1 and 2. Just one page back, 312, near the cross, we'll sing first and third verses. Jesus. 
Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mouth. Two hymns back, hymn number 310, I Would Draw Nearer to Jesus, will sing the first and last verses. I would draw nearer to Jesus. In his sweet presence abide, constantly trying to serve him, safe and secure at his side. I would draw nearer to Jesus. I would draw near. Opening hymn this morning is hymn number 373, Seeking the Lost. Would you stand and sing?
So I'm going to tell you a story that really happened. And this is a story based on a book that my grandfather wrote called Twink. And it's the story about a little cat named Twink and his people. Thank you. This is his boy, this is her boy, Timmy. And I think there's a picture for them to show of this so that all of you grown-ups can see. And Timmy has an older sister, Maureen, and they have mommies and daddies, and, they're, and their family is about to move from Connecticut to Stoneham, Massachusetts, when this story takes place. Now, the story that I'm going to read, it's as if Twink is talking and telling the story, OK? So there's a little bit of make-believe, but the story really happened, OK? You ready? And they'll put the picture up at some point for everybody to see Twink and his little boy, Tim. Some of you may know some of the people referenced in this story. You ready? Hiss. The noise scared me. It came from a big truck called a moving van. I was in the yard chasing sparrows when it stopped in front of the house. Some men came out of the truck, and they went into my house. At first, I was afraid of that big van. I crouched down on the grass, and I watched it to see if it was going to hiss anymore. As soon as it looked safe, I crept over to it, peeked under it, around the tires, and even inside. It had the biggest room I had ever seen, and it was empty. Soon, the front door opened, and men came out carrying furniture. I ran under the truck. And when they went into the truck, I decided to find out what was going on. Waiting until the next time the men went out into the truck, I quickly ran into the house. I expected to stop easily on the rug, but instead I slid across the wooden floor. And I didn't stop until I bumped into the wall on the far side of the room. I finally was able to look around, and guess what I saw? Boxes and boxes and boxes. Some were open, some were closed, some were full, and others were empty. The furniture was moved all out of place, and I went from one room to another, and it was all the same. People were moving things, and they were going in and out of all the rooms. Our neat little house looked like it had been hit by a hurricane. Everything was out of place. I felt very confused and very frightened. I didn't know where to go or what to do. In one room, I saw a long rug all rolled up, just like this. You see? It's kind of rolled up like a tube. I was scared, and I was worried about all the noises and the changes, and the rug looked like a great place to hide. So I crawled in, and I stayed very quiet and very still. But wait, wait. The rug, it's moving. Someone was lifting it up, and they were carrying it somewhere. I was too frightened to move or cry out. Who was it? Where were they taking me? Plop. Down went the rug, and I was upside down. But I laid very still and very quiet. More noises. There was scraping and bumping. Men came and went between the house and the truck several more times. I heard them talking about where to put this and where to put that. They brought in more furniture. And once more, they picked up the rug that I was hiding in, and they moved it again. At least this time, when they put it down, I was right side up. I heard the children calling to me. I heard their parents call. But I was too frightened. I couldn't make a noise. I couldn't even answer. Meow. It was so very dark. I could hardly move because the rug was rolled up so tight. I heard footsteps as the men came and went, and more furniture was put into the truck. I knew then that I was inside the big, noisy giant that goes hiss. I had to get out of there fast. But it was too dark and too stuffy. I started to crawl out of the rug, and then I heard a door slam and a lock click. Next thing, I heard that hiss sound again, and the truck began to move. I was locked up inside the moving van, and no one knew I was there. 
would I ever see Timmy and Maureen and their parents again? The truck left my home in Kensington, Connecticut, and it seemed like it traveled for hours and hours and hours, and I was very lonely and very worried in that big, big truck. I didn't know what was going to happen to me, so I curled up inside the rug, and I lay very still. Sometimes I heard horns blowing. The truck horn was really loud and sounded very different. I heard that hissing sound whenever it stopped. And there were other strange noises, like police car sirens and ambulances. And... But I was still so closed up in this small, dark place. I couldn't see anything, but all I heard were sounds, and they were scary. How I wished I was back home in Connecticut. There I'd be safe and warm with a bowl of milk, because I was getting thirsty and hungry. It'd been a long time. I imagine that soon after the truck left, Timmy, Maureen, and their parents must have searched every corner of the house. They went up to the attic, they went down to the cellar, they went to the garage, they searched the yard, they checked next door and over in the pastures. They asked the neighbors, and they saw that my friend Cat was all alone. It was a few days later when I found out that they had asked their neighbor and they were telling their neighbor, and Maureen had an idea of what had happened. She said maybe Twink is in the moving van. Since Timmy's father knew the roads that they were going to take, he called the toll booth at the entrance of the Massachusetts Turnpike and described the special colors and printing on the van. He told the attendant, we think our cat's in the moving van, and we're afraid she'll jump out and run away if the door is opened. Please tell the van driver to wait for us at the very first service area. And so the director, he called all the other toll booth operators and told them to look out for this special van. And you know what? The van drivers, they got the message. And that's why after it was getting really hot and I was really lonely and I started to panic, suddenly the van stopped and everything was quiet. It seemed to me an awfully long time before the van door opened. But what a joy it was to hear Timmy's father calling my name. Twink, twink. I was ready to leave. So I said, meow, as loud as I could to let him know I was there. And then I jumped over tables and boxes and chairs and I flew right into his arms. He carried me to his car and gave me to Timmy. Then he thanked the truck drivers and told them to follow him to our new house. Suddenly, everyone started talking at once. Maureen said, I was right, wasn't I? Twink did go in the van after all. Her mother said, it, it was a good idea that you called the toll station to get the message to the drivers. I'm glad we found Twink and got her back safely, her father said. But Timmy, he was busy talking to me, trying to help me calm down. I was shaking all over as Timmy set me on his lap. And it took a long time before I began to feel safe again. He kept stroking my back and telling me, it's all right now, you're safe. And it felt so good to curl up into his lap with his hands on my back and to hear the voices of the whole family again. I didn't move a muscle all the rest of the way to our new home. Have you guys ever gotten lost before? Or were trapped and scared? Maybe in the dark you woke up and you didn't know what happened after you had a bad dream? Yeah. You know, no matter how lost you are, there's always going to be someone who loves you and who's looking for you. Whether you get lost on purpose or by accident. And the person who's never going to stop looking for you, no matter where you go, do you know who that is? That's Jesus. He's always going to come and find you, and you can always be safe and curl up with him. Does anyone want to say our prayer today? You do? Okay, but before you say our prayer, we also have a birthday. You going to tell us whose birthday it is? Yeah, it's Kai Kai's birthday, and he is eight years old. Should we embarrass him and sing happy birthday? Yeah? Come on. And on his birthday, he's going to give us a scripture reading because he's an awesome guy. 
So we're going to sing happy birthday to Kylon. All right? cake for you at potluck next week. Okay? You ready? DDS, thank you for, for our fathers and our nannies and, and our mommies. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You guys can go back to your seats now. In today's call for the offering, there are three stories about holdups. In the first one, Elder Wayne Olson, who was an associate pastor at uh, the Battle Creek Tabernacle, had been visiting a church member, went out to his car, sat down in it, and was looking at some of his notes, figuring out what he was going to do next, when he heard someone come up to the side of his car, and he looked, and there's a guy with a gun pointing at him. And the fellow says, give me your wallet. So Elder Olson reached in, pulled out his wallet, handed it over. The thief took it, started to turn away. And Elder Olson said, wait a minute, you forgot something. The man came back and said, what did I forget? Elder Olson handed over a copy of Steps to Christ and said, you forgot this. Well, the fellow took off and Elder Olson went on his way and uh, don't know what became of that, the end of that story. There is a famous uh, Bible commentary by a scholar named Matthew Henry. And one day Matthew Henry was out uh, and he was robbed of his wallet and he was rather bothered by it as anyone would be. But he remembered the verse that says, in everything give thanks. So he, he was scratching his head, so he sat down and wrote in his diary. I am thankful, first, because that man had never robbed me before. <laughs> Second, even though he took my purse, he did not take my life. Third, he took all I possessed, but it wasn't very much. Fourth, I am glad it was I who was robbed and not I doing the robbing. A number of years ago in Junior Guide was a story. I remember reading it. This would have been back in the late 1950s or early 1960s. A uh, uh, elder or church treasurer, excuse me, may have been both, but anyway, was going from the church to a larger church where funds could be left in a more secure location. And as he was going through on his journey, it was going through a jungle. And uh, he knew that it was dangerous, but it was the only way to get to the larger church when he was accosted by a thief. And the thief says, give me all your money. So he started reaching into the pockets of his jacket and the pockets of his pants and handing over the bag with the coins and the set of bills and different things. The thief was taking it and putting it in his jacket. Then the thief looked at him narrowly and said, You know, you've got a nicer coat than I have. Give me your coat. So the elder took off his jacket, handed it over. The fellow, then he says, So what am I going to wear? Ah, oh, the thief said, and he took off his jacket handed it over, <laughs> fellow put it on, oh, it smelled, it was dirty, thief took off, and the elder started going on with his way, what was he going to say when he got to the church, and then he pat the pockets, and, oh, look it, there was money, and in the other pockets, there was the rest of the money, the thief had forgotten to transfer the money from one jacket to the other. So he still had all the Lord's money. And he continued on happily to where he could leave the money in a more secure location. We are ever so grateful for the kindness 
and protection of the Lord. The people collecting the offering can come forward now and we will have a prayer for today's offering as you return your tithe and offering. The loose offering, of course, goes to expenses including GBA. Thank you. Let's bow our heads. Our Father God in heaven, for your goodness to us, we are ever so grateful. As we return our tithe to you and give of our offerings, we are entrusting to you that you provide for us beyond anything we could ask or think. You give abundantly, and we thank you that you always make a way. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the scripture reading. Today, our scripture reading is found in Luke 15, verse 4. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come to you at this time to give you thanks and praise. We thank you that you've kept us all week long and that we are here and have to give you thanks. You've kept us in our right minds. We ask you to come with us wherever we go. We ask you to give us strength to read your, our Bibles and to learn of you. We ask you to remember Edgewood School and all our places of education. We ask you to keep the students and lecturers and teachers safely. We are sorry for those who have to care for the children in fear. We ask you, Father, to help us, give us strength, give us intuition that we will always think that your guardian, that our guardian angels are around about us. We ask you to help us to study our Bibles and to gain a fresh attitude towards your coming, because we need you to come soon. We ask you to forgive us of our sins and help us to live a life that counts for you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
If you are wondering, the story about Twink and the moving van actually made it to the newspaper. Um, so that's really interesting. Um, but I want to share another story today about another search that was in the newspaper. And most of the details from the story I'm getting from a New York Times article that was published earlier this week, last week. And you may have seen snippets of it, and you may have read it. Um, but this is the story of Carol and Vern King and their dog, Katie. So Carol and Vern, they were on vacation in Cowspell, Montana, with their beloved seven-year-old border collie, Katie. She was a child to them. They were retired for the most part, and Katie was a big part of their life. They were huge animal lovers, and she was a huge part of that. And so they had been on vacation, and they just got back from a late-night stock car race that they had gone to, and when they got back to their pet-friendly hotel, there was a problem. Katie wasn't there. She was missing. And she apparently, Katie, she's a smart dog because she managed to unlatch the door. There had been thunderstorms in the area, and they think maybe that's what spooked her. The front desk attendant remembered seeing an anxious dog just bolt across the way a few hours before. Now. Katie and her family, Carolyn Vern, their home is in Deer Park, Washington, and we've got a slide with how far that is from where they were in Montana. And they're so far away from home, they're distraught. Where do they even start looking in this small little town? I think they said it's a population of 23,000 people. Glacier National Park is not far. It's just for fields and forests and little subdivisions. Where would they go? Where would they find her? And so, they stayed out until 4 a.m. that first night, searching unfamiliar neighborhoods, searching through alfalfa farms. When they got back to the hotel, the front desk attendant had an idea, worked with them to take picture, get pictures of Katie and make flyers. And they made up hundreds of flyers all night long so that in the morning they could post them around town. And so they went, post them on on different polls, on message boards. They went door to door, knocking, passing out flyers. They stood outside sporting events that were going on, passing out flyers, looking for their dog. And if you notice in our neighborhood right now, there's people looking for a cat. Um, but these people, so the kings, they're looking for Katie. They harnessed the power of social media on Facebook and lost pet forums. Search teams started to form strangers who heard about Katie was missing, they decided to join in. And the Kings, they were able to utilize their skills because they were former law enforcement officers. And so they searched the abandoned buildings. They were out there examining animal tracks in the dirt, checking for dog droppings, trying to find Katie. But weeks went by. 
And every night, Vern says, when I went to bed, it was gut-wrenching. Is Katie warm? Did she get to eat today? It just tore us up inside. And so the kings decided that they needed to do more. And they ordered two game cameras, the ones that are used by wildlife researchers to see what animals go by and their motion activated. They ordered traps for animals. They hoped that maybe food, special food that Katie liked, like the cheese sticks that she was always begging for, they hoped that that would coax, coax her into a cage so they could bring her home. Soon, Carol began jogging and biking around the neighborhood. They know dogs recognize familiar smells, right? So she was hoping that her sweat would signal to the dog that their family was near. They, use, they left used t-shirts rolled up in strategic locations. They put out her blanket and her favorite food bowl. They later brought back from home hair shavings and even a couple buckets of manure from their horses from back home, and with the approval of the different landowners, they sat that up near the traps. They wanted Katie to know that this was familiar and this was good. Thinking she might be on the move at night, they bought night vision goggles. And they spent hours out in the cold, hoping to catch just a glimpse of their beloved Katie. But they saw no activity. The camera footage showed any other animal except for their dog. And the traps, they did catch something. They caught a magpie, a cat, and four skunks. But regardless of all the time that's passing, all the futile searching, the kings never lost hope. Tips were still coming in three weeks later, and they followed up on every single one of them. They would go 15 miles away on even a sighting that it might not quite be the right breed of dog. They would still go searching. But life back home in Washington didn't stop during the search. Because when Kara retired from law enforcement, as a law enforcement officer, she began to work as a postal carrier. And the summer is one of their busiest seasons, so she had to go back to her job. Vern stayed in Montana, spearheading the search about 250 miles away from home. So Carol, not content, to be at home without her dog, she asked for more time off of work. At this time, Kara, uh, Katie had been missing for 37 days. But the postal office, they couldn't give her her time off. So she did the only thing she could think to do. She gave them notice, and she quit her job. Katie was more important to me, she said. I just said, I'll finish this week, and that's it. And that's what she did. She went back to Montana, and Vern took a chance at home to stay and take care of the farm and the other animals. Now it's a month and a half later, and the kings, they're still searching, and they're still feeling hopeful. There's no sign of Katie, but there's no, also no evidence that she is dead. They didn't see that she'd been hit by a car. They didn't see any bodies. But you know, hope can be tiring sometimes. And you can have hope and at the same time still be distressed. In their hopefulness, they were still wondering, is Katie ever going to be found? And unsure of what to do, missing her house and her life and her other animals, Carol made the hard decision to start planning a trip back home. But her husband persuaded her to stay. Just one more week. New friends in Kingspell who have been encouragements these entire 50 plus days encouraged her to persist. Because these new friends in this town that she hadn't known before, they became a lifeline to the King family. Someone opened their home for them to stay in. Others committed hours of their own time to search for Katie. Landowners welcomed them to traipse around their, all their properties. Nothing was off limits. The kings couldn't believe the community that they had been welcomed into. Carol says, I got it out of sheer kindness from people, from a stranger to a stranger. And on the morning of September 15, 
57 days after Katie went missing, Carol got a tip from someone in the subdivision near the hotel where Katie had run from. He was looking out his window and he could have sworn Katie was in his backyard. With the same urgency in which she followed up every single tip, Katie and a friend rushed over. But by the time they got there, there was no dog in the yard. They walked through the fields nearby, searching with binoculars, looking for any sign. They found a couple out for a walk, told them of their search, and the woman pointed to a dog over there under the tree. It was a border collie. They began calling Katie's name. The dog was cautious, wary. Others in the group decided they needed to be silent so that Katie would just hear the voice of Carol, her mother. And as Carol called out, Katie came up running, jumped up full speed, and just leapt into her arms. All I could think about, Katie says, is I'm done. I got her, crying, holding on to her, wrapped her in a bear hug. I couldn't get her in the car fast enough to close her in so she wouldn't be loose again. And Katie immediately fell asleep on the front seat of the car. She was dirty. She was dehydrated. She'd lost 15 pounds in 57 days. They took her to the emergency vet, who as soon as the vet saw her, burst into tears. Because so many people were invested in finding Katie. You know, Carol said, you love your dog so much, and you just have to hope. And you know she's out there searching for you. You just can't give up. And this story, it just reminds me so much of someone else who doesn't ever give up on us. God could have abandoned this world after it became infected by sin. He could have cut off this dying creation in order to save the rest. But that wasn't good enough for God. From the beginning, he knew that he would have a plan to save his children those created in the divine image, cherished and loved, regardless of how dirty and scruffy and malnourished they may be. Because from the beginning, there was a plan to bring us back home, even before we needed it. And while Jesus' death and sacrifice in our place was powerful enough to have saved anyone who has ever lived or will ever live on this earth, we're told in Christ's object lessons that if there had been but one soul, Christ would have died for that one. Amen. To Christ, you are the soul that matters. Always searching for you, no matter how far you're running scared, running afraid. Always looking and never giving up. And that's the kind of love and commitment that we take time to remember today during our communion service. Remember that God has given his all for us so that we can be together with him when he comes back again. At this time, we're going to separate for our foot washing service. Foot washing is a time for us to recommit ourselves to God, almost like a mini rebaptism, to set aside differences we have with each other and just come back and to focus with God. So we're going to split off, and then we're going to come back and partake of the emblems of the bread and juice. And we have, remember our exits are in the back. You can go down this side. There's a side stairwell as well as the elevator. Downstairs in the fellowship hall is where the women will be meeting. We have men. I believe it's in the primary room, maybe in the junior room. There are signs that say that. And then families are in the creator roll and kindergarten room. So we'll have you go at the, this time, and please come back, and we will continue communion together after the foot washing.
communion was is something that has been instituted um, by Christ during the last week of his life. Um, it comes from the Passover, the idea of release from slavery, um, release from sin and suffering, and the hope of a coming Messiah. And that was manifested in Jesus, the answer to the promise coming. And during his final days here on earth, he celebrated pa Passover with his disciples, those nearest and dearest to him. And he set it up for us to also take part in communion, to think not only of his death and the sacrifice that that brought for us, but also the great hope of the resurrection, that death doesn't have to be the end. And we um, practice open communion. So as the deacons come around and pass down, if you feel so inclined, um, it doesn't matter your denomination, affiliation, your age, if you feel called to take part in communion, we want to encourage each and every one of you to do that. And we find the communion service laid out by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And he reminds us that, For I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we pray? Our kind, dear Heavenly Father, you give us so much. You gave us so much, and you're still giving us so much. May this emblem of bread remind us of how much you love us, how much you gave to us, and how much we look forward to working side by side with you, reaching out to those that need to know about the bread. Thank you for the light, the understanding, the courage, and the uh, everlasting presence of your love through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And likewise, in the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He bled on the cross uh, to save each and every one of us in the whole world so that we all can be together with you someday in him. We ask that you bless uh, this juice that represents his blood, Lord. May we go from here today rejuvenated knowing that you love us and care for us and are always there for us. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. For it, the bread is right underneath on a second cup, and you'll take off the lid. Jesus tells us, we're told the original communion story and Passover feast from Jesus in Matthew chapter 26. And this is from the Lord's Supper, verse 26. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And then he had taken a cup and given thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So just like in that day, we too are going to eat and drink.
And just like Jesus and his disciples, we are going to end with a song. I want to remind you, you can just leave your cups in your pew. Someone will come around to take them, so you don't have to worry about that. But we're going to close with the song, Because He Lives, number 526. And I ask that you join me in standing as we sing this song. Before we close in prayer, I want to let you know of an opportunity we have. If you would like to have special time of prayer, I will be up front for that. We do have, we'll have offering collection in the back and the side exits to give to our family assistance fund for those in need. And again, if you need special prayer or would like that, um, I will be up here in the front. Let us pray. Dear gracious God, we are so thankful that we have every hope and every joy because at the end of it all, it doesn't matter if we live. It only matters that you live. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching our program today. If you have any questions, please call us at 781-438-2977. Again, that is 781-438-2977. We hope to see you soon in person here at our church on Saturdays for our 1045 a.m. worship service or for Monday night prayer time at 7 p.m. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.